I welcome you to our voyage through the Gospel of Matthew. We continue our study chapter after chapter and a verse or so by verse or so through the Gospel of Matthew. We are Matthew chapter 10 and verses 40 to 42. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. The New American Standard Bible. What does it mean for Jesus to label some of his disciples apostles? Is it just a fancy title to denote someone who is in a managerial role, someone who has some important stature, standing, etc.? I say this because there is a real danger that titles in the church become meaningless. In other words, if you are employed by the church, then you are to be called a reverend or minister. In the same way that if you work for some companies, you are a partner or an associate. What do those terms really mean? Titles come, titles go. As linguistic fashions, you know, change as much as whether skirts should be worn to the ankles or above the knees. In the present era, there is a lot of informality when it comes to addressing people. Now, I understand to a degree where this comes from, and this is not necessarily bad, but some of it is not necessarily good. There is a sense that this practice further erodes the use of titles in the church. What I'm addressing is not the use of titles, but the idea that there is something that stands behind this title. Why did Jesus call a group of men apostles? One of the problems when you translate from one language to another is that in the new language, some of the nuances of the original word are lost. You simply cannot carry the range of meanings from one language into another. The word apostle is an example of this. The word is a noun that has a related verb form in the Greek, and the related Greek form is just simply a verb that means to send. So the word apostle carries within it as a noun the idea of one who is sent. Now think here in terms of a diplomat. A diplomat is a person who is sent from one country to another country. That person is sent as a representative of the country that they have come to, and so they go to a host country to be a representative and to speak for their king or their government and reflect ideas and policies therein. So the word apostle carries the sense of one who represents another one or their interest. In other words, an apostle is one because he stands in for Jesus himself. In foreign relationships, we know that a country can sometimes express its displeasure to another country by banishment of its diplomats. If you want to read rightly verses 40 to 42 of Matthew chapter 10, you have to understand what was said in the above paragraph. Jesus continues to send out into the world people who represent him. In some cases, these people are rejected. What people can do is say, I'm not against Jesus, I'm against that person. The problem is, when you reject Jesus' envoys, you are rejecting Jesus. That is why in formal diplomatic practice, countries will reject diplomats. It is a way of rebuke against the country 
that that diplomat or those diplomats come from. Jesus says, no, for when you reject those I send out, you are rejecting me. In other words, we say that where people, uh, we can say where people stand in regards to Jesus is going to be seen by how they treat God's people and in particular God's leadership. Implicit in this passage is the notion that the treatment of God's leader and leaders is a reflection of our faith commitment. Now go back to the first paragraph and revisit the topic of what we call church leaders. There is a place for, uh, for proper respect for those who have duly prepared for the role of leadership in the church and have been set aside or in formal speak ordained for that role. You see, the downplaying of the use of titles obscures the importance of these roles. Now, I think in the church, there are some pastors who want to downplay the use of titles because they want to downplay the importance of their role and in the process downplay their responsibility to uphold certain standards within that role and uphold the nature of what that role is before the people. You see, a pastor is not just simply a religious leader in a congregation. A pastor is a person who by title and position is called to lead in terms of faith and faith commitment. They may not necessarily be the most mature Christian in the church, but it's not just, you know, a minor thing that they have that title. There is also nothing that leadership can do in the church if leadership is not affirmed by those in the church. And so we need to affirm the rightful place of leadership in the church and those that have that leadership and have expressed through their life and lifestyle the commitment to it to uphold their role of leadership in the church. Now note that being affirming of leadership is not the same as being blind to its following failings. We must affirm leadership in the church and we must hold it accountable. 